Oh, hello. In today's video, we're going to do a rundown of the newly released Plague Marine kill team. So, a full faction review, let's go. So, introduction. First of all, I want to apologise, this uh, PowerPoint isn't going to quite look as clean as uh, my others that I've been doing. The guy who really helped the channel by um, linking me to all of the image files extracted from the app um, hasn't extracted the Plague Marine files from the app yet, so... Um, I, I've used the screenshots from the PDF instead, so that's why things look a little bit different. Um, so the Plague Marines are a fixed list team, which I know is disappointing to some. Um, we were hoping, perhaps, that they were going to get access to some of the other options that exist in the Plague Marines box. Um, I, I think it's a good thing. In, you know... I think it's a good thing because it really cements their faction identity. They don't have that much ranged punch. And I think if they've been given um, the operatives in the Plague Marine box and they've been given the Melter Gun and the Plasma Gun, um, it would have really... It would have made them more powerful, but it would have really diluted what they're about. I think this is a really splendid team where... You know, the Plague Marines are really, really resilient. But they, they're not that killy. They haven't got any kind of really big guns that are going to one-hit kill uh, another Marine. Um, you know, their only ranged weapons are bolters. They're really quite powerful in close combat. And they've got a lot of debuffs in close combat. And they've got a lot of tricks to kind of keep them alive. Um... And I quite like, I've said before, it's going to be a shame if um, the Plague Marines are less resilient than the Thousand Suns. I actually think they might be less resilient than the Thousand Suns, but I think Thousand Suns need a balance update. Um, but I like the, the spaces that they're in. Because Thousand Suns really want to engage you at long range, and they want to keep you at long range. Because all of their defense starts to fall down a bit. You know, they're not awful in combat, but all of their defense starts to fall down a bit when you close in with them. Plague Marines, they, they kind of trudge up the board, and you are going to get opportunities to try and shoot them and outmaneuver them, and that's their flaw. And if you can play around them and outmaneuver them and run round and pan beacons and get behind them and claim their home objective, that's a. They've got a real. They've got, it seems like a weird thing to celebrate, they've got a real clear weakness. But they're going to be really hard to kill. And they're going to be, if they actually get into you in a straight fight, they're going to be really, really annoying and they're going to do really, really well. So I, I really like, actually, on, on reflection, the fact that they have been limited to the things that they have. Because it gives them, it lets them be really strong at the things they should be strong with and have that balanced by weaknesses. Um, in my opinion, in, in in places where they should be really weak, like they, if they just slapped in like oh have a have a have a melter gun, have have a have a have a have a plasma gun, even the blight launcher, which is a character thing, but it's another long range weapon. The fact they've just got nothing like there's a really long range threat is is pretty good. They got no they got no real. The only piercing you bring in this team is, is crack grenades uh, and a plasma pistol, right? It, yeah, so I like them. Um, I, I think they operate in a really cool space. Um, they are security and seek and destroy. I think, based on what I've said before, I think security is mainly where you want to go. You can possibly, like, they're not pathetic at killing. You could possibly make a decent fist at seek and destroy, especially if you're playing against um, a seven wound team, an eight wound team, right? But I really think that they're going to shine with security. I could be wrong. You have seven specialists you are deciding which one not to bring. Genuinely ignore the fact that one of the um, the specialists is named Warrior. He's not like Warriors in other factions. You can't just take Warriors, because if you could, just taking loads of Warriors might be a play, honestly. Um, and he is as good, he is in contention with all of the others. Right? I, I think you... Actually, you fairly often drop the heavy gunner. Um, and then if you're in a situation where you want the heavy gunner, then maybe you do drop the warrior. I think those are the two that you swap um, between. 
most of the time. Let me know if you disagree in, in the comments below. Interestingly, it says down here in this little box out, Nurgle's number is seven and his sigil shows three. From those numbers does his corruption flow. And people are like, what? Is this is this law in the rules thing? It's, it's their way of explaining it. We're going to see there's a lot of things that are seven rather than eight. Um, and that are three when perhaps they could have been two. And they've so they've tried to weave those numbers in, which is pretty cool. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, I, I like that as, as, a, as a concept. So the faction rules, they've got three big faction rules. So they've got Astartes. We're familiar with Astartes, and we're also familiar with the fact that it varies um, from team to team to team. So joining each friendly prey win opt is activation. It can perform either two shoot actions or two fight actions. If it's two shoot actions, a bolt pistol, a bolt gun, or a psychic weapon must be selected for at least one of them. You cannot select the same psychic weapon more than once per activation. So we have a psyker who is um, at least superficially to the th similar to the Thousand Sun Psychers. He has two different psychic shooting attacks. So you can do those two psychic shooting attacks in the same turn if that's what you want to do. That's, that's an option for you. Uh, otherwise, it's just you can double fire bolters or you can fire something else and a bolter or you can double fight. Okay. Then we've got Poison. Poison is the real faction rule. It's the real kind of really key ability that we're going to talk about all the way through this team. Um, I'll read it first. Nurgle deals in warp-tainted poisons, toxins, viral plagues, and sicknesses of the soul that defy both natural resilience and medical intervention. Some weapons in this team's rules have the poison weapon rule. Poison. In the resolve attack by step, you inflict damage. If you, if you inflict damage with any success, the operative, the weapon is being used against, gains a poison token if it doesn't already have one. Whenever an operative get, has one of your poison tokens is activated, inflict one damage on it. So poison is really a key ability. You're going to be handing out poison tokens. You're going to try and get one poison token on every model on the enemy's team. That's that's the plan. Okay, one damage and activation is okay. It's fine. You know, against some teams, sort of seven moon teams, that's a you know that's going to add up, right? Against another marine team, the marine goes eh, okay, right? But as we'll see, and I'll round them all up at the end. There's a lot of other random abilities that key off the target being poisoned, things that are enabled when they're against a poisoned target in some way. And then we've got Disgustingly Resilient, which is the typical Nurgly resilience ability. It says the followers of Nurgle possess extreme resilience to bullet and blade, for their hideous forms are swollen by death, decay and disease. Whenever an attack dice inflicts a damage of 3 or more on a friendly Plague Marine operative, roll 1d6. On a 4-up, subtract 1 from the inflicted damage. So this is really good. Um, you know, we've seen a similar but toned-down effect on Legionaries with the Mark of Nurgle. They roll a d6, and on a 5, they can ignore a damage. But theirs only works on normal dice. So this is buffed in two ways. It works on normal and crits, okay, and it's on a 4+. So, that to me is really good. It's satisfying to me that it's better than Nurgle Legionaries, right? Because my conception of how this should be, you know, if you choose to play the Plague Marines, you should be better at being Nurgle than the Nurgle-marked Space Marines, Right, what the legionaries gain is the ability to flex between one matchup and another. Now, that's not quite where the balance is with legionaries. I think most people pick all Nurgle most of the time. But that's where the balance should be, where in legionaries, the four things are pretty balanced, and the fact that you can flex between them is, is the advantage. Whereas if you're choosing to play Plague Marines, you get to do one thing, but you get to do it better than they get to do it. And I, I, that, that's good, and that satisfies me. I think this is a good... Uh, meaningful ability, you know, when somebody shoots you, most of the time you're going to roll four dice, uh, and you're just going to take two less wounds, um, you know, on average, most things are four dice attacks, right, so you, you're going to take one or two less wounds, depending on how many hits they get through, right, you're going to take one or two less wounds every single time somebody shoots you, and in combat, it's really, really, really good, um, because of course in combat, the longer that you are alive, the more of your own dice that you can resolve. So whereas in shooting, it's like, cool, you take one or two wounds less. In combat, it's not only that you're going to take one or two wounds less, it's that you're potentially going to win a combat that you would otherwise have lost 
because you're going to get an extra dice through and kill them before they can finish you off, right? So I think that this is one of the reasons that I think that the Plague Marines, it's not the only reason, but the Plague Marines, they want to get up close. They want to get up close. They want to get into people, okay? Um, because they're, they're, they're disgustingly resilient. Is to, to my way of thinking, it's even more of an advantage uh, when they're in combat and those dice are coming in one at a time. Strategy ploy. So we're going to start with Contagion. Plague Marines are oozing with Contagion. Their hideous forms are emanating a miasma of decay that saps the vigour of their foes. I love the word miasma. That's great. Subtract two from the move stat of an enemy operative and worsen the hit stat of its weapons by one. This isn't cumulative with being injured whenever the following are true. It's within control range of friendly Plague Marine operatives. So straight away, all, if you're in combat with somebody, they're getting their they they they're getting they're hitting on minus one. This is really really strong. Okay, counting as injured just whenever you're in combat is really really strong. Okay, this is another reason why the, the Plague Marines. They want to be in combat. They want to be in combat because they're more resilient. They're more resilient because they've got this contagion ploy up, but also their other form of resilience, I believe, matters more in combat. I'll keep reading. It has one of your poison tokens and is visible to, or vice versa, and within three inches of a friendly plague marine, friendly plague marine operatives. I have to confess, I'm not entirely sure what or vice versa in parentheses is doing to this sentence. Right, let me know in the chat if you can make head and a tail of this. I think the sentence makes perfect sense if we ignore the parentheses, right? It has one of your poison tokens and is visible to and within three inches of friendly play of a friendly of friendly play marine operatives. I don't understand what the vice versa is vice versa. -ing. It has one of your poison tokens and is visible to or vice versa. Is visible to you or you're visible to it? Like is there a is that what it's saying is there a possibility of one model being visible to the other model but that visibility is always reciprocal isn't it like i don't understand what the vice versa if you can explain vice versa to me in the comments go for it um but again so essentially if they're poisoned it's not just in base to base it's also within three which is great and if it's visible to and within three of the friendly uh, icon bearer, so essentially the icon bearer always counts um, them as being uh, a poison. That's fine. That's cool. Honestly, I'm not that stressed about the poison tokens part. Like, that's nice and it will come up and it will help you for sure. Um, but, like, getting minus one to hit in combat is, is really quite good. Um like yeah they'll have minus one shooting if you're within three of them and they decide to shoot you that's helpful um it's i guess it's especially helpful what this is doing you've given them the, you've given them the minus two move right so what it's trying to lock down is is fall back and shoot right um but it it doesn't quite do it against most teams right so if you're a six inch move team and then you subtract two from your move so then your um, oh, maths. Let me math this properly. Hang on. If you're a six-inch move team and you subtract two from your move, and you've got a four-inch move, and you move back four inches, you won't. Logically, you're not within three because you've moved back four inches, right? Um, but yeah. So against dwarves <laughs> against dwarves this is sad um because they move back if you move back three are you still within three i for some reason this is bamboozling my brain and it shouldn't i'm sure people are screaming at the screen if you move back three you're not still within three because you've moved back three as long as you move yourself totally precisely right so no it's not i, I thought it was to do with falling back but it's not i, I don't quite get what they're mm. I don't quite get what they are uh, kind of kind of grasp at with this with this three inch thing. But I guess if someone's just there, if someone's just within three inches of you somehow and they want to shoot you, they might as well want to hit. But I don't know how much shooting happens within three inches. 
because they can still fall back four inches or three inches. Yeah. If you fall back three inches, you'll be three inches away, so you will not be within three inches. Obviously, you might be within three inches, but you can tell your opponent, I was in base to base, I'm moving back exactly three inches. So we can understand that mathematically, it's possible for me to not be within three inches. Um, regardless of what the millimetre says on the table, that's where we are with that, isn't it? I spent too long thinking about this, right? I'm going to ignore those last two bullet points, right, for a minute. Just with the first bullet point on its own, this is amazing, right? The three inches extra range bit. Maybe I'm being really stupid and someone's ferocity typing in the comments to correct me. Please do. I, I want to learn. Um, I don't think that the three inches poison token thing is that relevant, but I'm sure there will be times when it happens to be useful, right? Because of how games be. Um, yeah. Lumbering death. Plague Marines are methodical and uncompromising in their approach to warfare, advancing and firing with steadfast determination. Whenever a friendly Plague Marine operative is shooting or fighting during an activation in which it hasn't moved more than three inches, or whenever it's retaliating, its weapons have the ceaseless special rule. Um, ceaseless is a great rule. So the way, like, off the bat, I think Plague Marines want to play, where they try and get into the centre... Um, and then mill around in the centre trying to do stuff. Like, you don't want to stray from that centre if you're trying to control the centre line, control the centre of the board uh, too much. So I think maybe turning this on, turning point two, if you're kind of in where, where more or less in where you want to be. And bear in mind, it doesn't stop you if you go, OK, I'm going to have to move my full five. Um, it doesn't stop you from moving one of your models more than three and the rest of your team potentially still benefiting from ceaseless, which for one CP is probably pretty good. I must, Basically, you don't use it in turning point one because you've only got two long-range weapons and you're going to want to move up more than three inches. You're going to want to move your full five, possibly five, and, and a dash, right? Uh, so, yeah. Um, it also works whenever you're retaliating, which is pretty cool if you're against hordes, right? So may maybe, maybe if you're playing against a horde team, you think about this in turning point one just because you know you're going to get retaliation shots potentially, maybe, don't know. Um, but yeah, it's a really cool ploy, I like it. Um, we've got Cloud of Flies, which is also really cool. Disgusting, fat-bodied flies swarm the kill zone, blurring the forms of advancing plague marines and absorbing the enemy's projectiles. So this is helping you in your core mission, which is in, you know, to get up to the, to, the, to the middle of the board. You could just put your Cloud of Flies, like measure out where you're probably going to be able to get to around the centre of the board with your 5-inch move and maybe your 3-inch dash, if that's what you're going to do, and put your Cloud of Flies marker down there right so then you can try and move your plague marines from the safety of their deployment zone into the cloud of flies marker now this could still be a trap right in that um you know you might think oh i'll go there and i'll be concealed and that'll be great but then like i made this mistake a few times when i was playing night lords don't go somewhere because it's okay to be there because you're concealed if you could go somewhere else um and uh, uh, not considered obscured, right? But if you could go somewhere else and just not be shootable because you're actually not visible because you're behind a big wall, because there are things like be mindful, there are weapons out there, there are some teams that have two sources of ignore obscuring, right? So just be mindful, there are abilities uh, that can key off simply being visible. You are visible in the cloud of flies, but. The nice thing about Cloud of Flies is it's a 20mm marker with a 3-inch bubble around that 20mm marker, right? That's that's huge, right? That's almost a 7-inch a uh, diameter. Not quite 7 inches, but that's almost a 7-inch diameter marker on a kill team table. That's pretty good, right? That's a pretty broad area of, of, of flies. So be mindful of what it isn't. Um, I would certainly say... Um, you know, be mindful of the things it doesn't do that smoke grenades do. It doesn't give you the um, it doesn't give you the immunity to uh, crit, crit, right? It doesn't say uh, no. It it does. It doesn't give you immunity to. 
Like, smoke grenades do an extra thing. They make you immune to piercing, don't they? That's what they do, yeah. It doesn't give you that. So if you're being shot by something that has regular piercing, um, then the, it, you will still be pierced in your in your flies. But I still think it's powerful, and it's powerful enough to get that on a CP that I don't want to take smoke grenades with this team, I don't think. Um, and what else is nice about it? So it doesn't... Unlike smoke grenades, it doesn't last like a couple of activations into the next turn. But what it does do... Um, it disappears in the ready step of the next strategy phase, but then in the strategy phase, you can put it back where it was if you wanted it there for another CP before your opponent gets to, you know, so occasionally you can just permanently say, my cloud of flies is here, and as long as you don't get out, run out of CP, your cloud of flies is going to stay there, um, you know, which is pretty good. Then we got Nurglings. I love a Nurgling. I don't love this ploy. Uh, the smallest of Nurgle's demons, Nurglings are both malicious and playful, cackling wildly as they claw and harass the Plague Marine's foes with pestilent claws and teeth. Select one enemy operative within three of a friendly Plague Marine operative, or one enemy operative that has one of your poison tokens and is within seven of a friendly Plague Marine operative until the end of that selected operative's next activation. Subtract one from its APL stat, which... It's not bad. It's pay a CP. Hey, he's got minus one APL. It's a bit weird that it's a strategy ploy. Um, you know, so what you have to be you have to use it at the start of the turn. You can't use it as a tactical ploy where you have moved up first and then you go, aha, you're minus one APL, right in the middle of an activation. So it's something you have to look at the board state from turning points onwards and be like do I want to spend a CP to take a, a, an action an APL off someone? Occasionally, occasionally, that'll be the right ploy, right? Because occasionally you'll be able to see something like, well, you know, if, if, if you know, I'm thinking of those turning point four plays, like, oh, he's got this one Marine left, um, you know, and if he moves and dashes and taps that, right, then he's just about won the game. But if he, And you might just be able to go, oh, okay, um, I am within... I can be within seven, he's poisoned, I'll spend the CP, he's two APL. And in those little clutch situations, it might really come in. But I think it's a late game ploy. Um, you know, minus APL is good. I think one of the ways in which I'm poor at kill team is I constantly undervalue subtracting APL. But just the fact that it comes in in the strategy, play, prep, strategy phase makes it feel a little bit weird and inflexible to me. Uh, you know, it's certainly not as good as the other three. I think Contagion you want to have up every single turn. Good job if your icon is alive, it's free, so that's fine. Uh, Lumbering Death, you're looking at for turning point two, potentially turning point three. Depends how your board state goes, but certainly it's one of those turning point two. This is the, this is a turn where there's going to be a lot of, of stuff happening, so we'll have Ceaseless, okay? And Cloud of Flies potentially turning point one um and turning point two and maybe turning point three but you're gonna have to look at the board and think to yourself hey um you know do i need to put this down i mean if you're playing on beta decima then yes you're going to be very pleased that you have cloud of flies because beta decima is like planet bowling ball right um and, and this is really really helpful in that environment but if you're playing on volcus is this something that you want and need every turn, or can you move slightly elsewhere? It is going to let you move in straight lines, I guess, if you can place down your own area of um, of obscured. So just play it by ear. Don't try and be too rigid with it. Don't try and be too high band with it. But it is a really good ploy. And then nurglings, I think, is a sometimes food. Firefight ploys. So we've got virulent poison. Uh, the most potent of Grandfather Nurgle's foul plagues spread swiftly through the air, breaching even enviro seals and filtration masks. Use this firefight ploy during a friendly Plague Marine operative's activation or counteraction. Before or after it performs an action, select one of the following. One enemy operative within three of that operative gains one of your poison tokens if it doesn't have one. Or, right, because it's select one of the following. Roll 2d6. If the result is 7 up, uh, yeah, you know, one enemy operative within seven of the operative gains a poison token. So, like, bear in mind, um, seven is the average roll on two dice, right? So you're fairly likely to get that, but it is still a gamble, and you have to choose. You can't roll two dice to see if you get a seven, and then if you fail, go, oh well, I'll poison this guy within three instead. Um, it's an odd ploy. 
I this is one of those ones that may change when I have um, actually played some games with the team. But f on the read through, I don't know how often you're using this because, as we'll see when we go through the data sheets, uh, and I'll kind of summarise this at the end. You have a lot of ways of handing out poison tokens. You are handing out poison tokens left, right, and centre. Um, so. How often are you going to need to spend a CP to hand out a poison token? That said, I do think on the leader um, who has a sword that gets better when he's fighting someone who is poisoned, if you are squaring off to charge somebody who is not poisoned, and you have, maybe you've been going second a whole lot, if you are awash with CP, I can see this being very tempting to go charge, and then go, okay, cool, this guy that I'm basically raised contact with, virulent poison, you're now poisoned, okay, cool, now I'm going to fight. Um, just to get, just to unlock the buffs, that because the, the boss, we'll, we'll see on his card in a minute, the boss really wants to be in combat with somebody who is poisoned already, so that's, that's really when I'd be using it. Um, yeah. Then we got Poisonous Demise. The body of a plague marine plays host to countless poisons and plagues. Upon death, their bloated forms may detonate, spreading foul contagion all around. Use this firefight ploy when a friendly plague marine operative is incapacitated. Each enemy operative visible to and within three of that operative gains a poison token if they don't have one. For each of those enemy operatives that already has a poison token, including if they gained one during this action, in for each of those enemy operatives that already has one of, one of your poison tokens... Including if they gained one during this action. Uh, so everyone? Is, is that what that means? It, it explodes, it gives out poison tokens, and then to everyone with a poison token, including the ones it's just given out, yeah, they take one damage. But then it says instead. Hey. Much like the vice versa, I'm being bamboozled by the brackets. Enemy operatives... For each of those enemy operatives that already has one of your poison tokens, inflict one damage on them instead makes perfect sense. Right? So it explodes. You either get a poison token, or, if you already have a poison token, you instead take a damage. But the bit in brackets, including if they gained one during this action seems to imply that you give out poison tokens and, and then you give out one damage for everybody. But then the word instead is that I'm just going to ignore the brackets, lads. Because that's the way the ability makes sense in my brain. Again, if I'm being a brackets idiot, um, uh, you know, um, please, please, you know, if I'm being a parentheses pedestrian or a, a, a brackets buffoon, please let me know in, in the comments. Um... With this one and, and the weird vice versa one. So, oh, Poisonous Demise. It's an explode on death. It's pretty situationally useful. If you have people around you that you've not yet poisoned and it feels worth it to you to spend a CP to get the poison on them because you can see that it's you're going to be able to capitalise on that before you'll put poison on them another way, that's that's fine. Um, it could be that you've got guys around you with poison on. And in fairness, if you've just been... Um, if somebody's incapacitated a marine within three, they've probably been in combat with that marine, and they've quite possibly been poisoned in that combat, and maybe they've survived that combat. Like if, you, if you're in the, the the situation where you go, oh, you survive on one wound, and it's happened to all of us, like, oh, you survived the fight on one wound, cool. One CP, poisonous demise, bang, you're dead too. I mean, that's always lovely, isn't it? Right? So, yeah. Uh, it's all right. It's sometimes food. Uh, like virulent poison, it's all right to sometimes food. The two show shoppers, the, the two show stoppers are coming next. Okay, sickening resolve by voluntar voluntarily offering their bodies as hosts for the grandfather's contagious gifts. Some plague marines are granted even greater endurance. Use this firefight ploy when an attack dice inflicts damage on a friendly plague marine operative. Until the end of the activation or counteraction, for the purposes of disgusting resilient um, rule for this operative. Always subtract one from the damage inflicted to a minimum of two. You don't need to roll. So, this is amazing. But, you're going to need to slow down a little bit. So, if you haven't used this ploy yet, right, they're, they're, they're they're going to roll their dice, right? You're going to look at the dice that they've rolled. 
You're going to see how many incoming uh, incoming hits and things there are. You're going to roll your saves. You're going to see how many you save. And then you're going to stop and you're going to do some counting and understand what you're buying for your CP. And be like, okay, how many wounds will I be left alive on if I spend the CP? How many? Because you only get to do this once per turning point. And you probably want to do it every turning point. But the enemy's probably going to try and get a good shot on you more than once per turning point, right? Understand how many wounds you are buying with your CP right just slow down do the math work it out because this is one of those lovely firefight ploys where you are privy to all the information okay good you can also do this in combat right but it's less good so in a combat, you can do it after they inflict damage with the first dice to make your disgusting resilience an auto, which is going to be worth doing sometimes, okay? But your opponent can react to that, reassess the math themselves, choose to parry or do other things. Um, and so it's not you don't have every single piece of information. Against shooting attack, this is the first thing that you get to do right against a you may well want to do it in combat as well right because four ups are not 100 percent of the time but just bear in mind it will you'll do the maths you'll work it out you'll maybe talk about it a little bit well i could do this you could do that i could do this you could do that and then you'll put this into the mix and your opponent's going to reassess well actually now maybe i want to parry or do something else so just bear all that in mind curse of rot is the other really fantastic ploy um, to engage a space marine in single combat is to expose oneself to wilting contagion and soul eroding decay. Use this firefight ploy when a friendly plague marine operative is fighting against or shooting against an enemy operative within three or within seven if it has one of your poison tokens. Okay, so you're fighting against or shooting against an enemy operative. After your opponent rolls their attack or defense dice, right? For every result of three that they roll, inflict one damage, the result is treated as a fail, and they can't re-roll it. Right. So this is, again, you're going to have to really, 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 like, if you've got this active, you're going to have to really, really slow down the game. Because I know what people are like. I know what I'm like. You, 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 you're in a combat. If you've got... um. You know, sometimes I'm playing against Zimbad and I'm reading my card for the fight action we're about to do and he's already picked up his dice, rolled them, re-rolled bits and pieces with, with Relentless or whatever he's got and then I do my thing and, you know, because we trust one another and then I sort of say, oh, what have you got? Like, oh, three hits and a crit or two hits and a crit because we don't cheat, right? Um, and I'm not exactly cognizant of exactly what he's rolled or how he's got there necessarily all the time you know and um, we played a game the other day and a, a good two-thirds of zimbad's rolls were behind the giant building and i just had no clue of what they were because my table that i play on is quite small um and you know and that's fine when you're playing against your mate but with this ploy you're gonna have to be like roll okay exactly what did you roll because your threes if you you know if you do a roll and you go i got four hits and you go cool but they're all threes so i play this and you discard all your dice and take four damage um which uh, the, so against marines it's 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 hilarious because a marine offer a marine a three on either a, a fight uh, dice or a um a, a defense dice against shooting that's generally a success right so like there could be a situation where this just ruins the day of another marine player even another plague marine player right because they just roll five threes or three threes or whatever it is you just go oh, okay no they're all gone against non-marines it's still useful because while a three is generally a fail um you stop them being able to re-roll it and you do a little bit of damage as well which is nice I will say it stops them from being able to re-roll it, but if you're playing against... Um, I'm trying to think now. I was going to say Kazakin, but Kazakin don't do that anymore. Do Novitiates... I don't actually know. I haven't reviewed Novitiates yet. Do Novitiates still get to add to dices, to modify dices without re-rolling them? I don't think they do. So, yeah, ignore me. 
a really funny ploy, especially against other Marines. But it does just have that issue where... And in a tournament, you've generally got someone that usually... I never bring a dice tray. I have a dice tray, but I always forget it. But my opponents generally have a dice tray. And you only have a lot more space in a tournament game. So it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, but you have to be cognizant of exactly what they've rolled. But apart from that... Those two really good ploys. You probably want to try and have the CP in your, in your pocket, if you can, um, to think about playing both of those every turn, which is a hard ask, considering I also told you to definitely try and do two or three of these strat ploys every turn. But, you know, they're really good. The other two, I don't know. They're, they're, they're useful, but they're not necessarily as, as useful. Right, on to the data card. So... We get our first glimpse at the basic stat line. They're APL3 with a 5-inch move, 3-up save, and the, the leader's got 15 wounds. He's, he's got the extra wound for being a leader. So it's the standard Marine stat line with... I've written 1-inch on the slide because I can't... Uh, be, yeah, no, it's 1-inch with 1-inch less moves. So they've got 5-inch moves instead of 6. So they, they lost lost an inch of movement for being smelly. That's fine. We can live with that. The Plague Marine Champion has a standard plasma pistol. It does what you expect a plasma pistol to do. Um... Unlike the starter set rules, where it was a bit weird, and everyone was like, oh, what's that? Um, standard plasma pistol. He's got a pretty good sword, right? Five dice hitting on threes. Wow. Uh, four, five. Okay. Severe, so it's guaranteed a crit uh, when it, um, you know, w w when it swings. If it doesn't roll a crit, you get a crit. Okay. Um, poison, so it will poison people. It will put poison on when you deal damage. Uh, and it's toxic so whenever this operative is using this weapon against an enemy operative that has one of your poison tokens add one to the damage stats of this weapon now i'm really unsure exactly how this works so if you are a rules uh, a lawyer please do let me know in the comments your opinion um if you charge somebody who is not poisoned and you roll when you resolve your first hit you place a poison um marker on on the enemy does that mean that your subsequent hits in that fight action can benefit from toxic right because i'm not sure they can um i think the poison marker definitely goes on when you resolve the first damage dice because it's when you do damage with right but i feel like and i could be wrong uh, whenever an operative is using this weapon, I think technically the the I am using this weapon is when you announce, you know, and people don't generally announce it because it's not generally relevant. But like, I am going to fight you now with a plague sword. That part where you select the weapon, that is using the weapon. And I think I don't know. That's when it would perform the check to see if your opponent was poisoned. That was really weird. If you can imagine a character, and there are a few in the game, with two combat weapons, you'd have to decide which one to use and declare, oh, I'm going to use my this weapon or my that weapon. Or indeed, with this model, you've got two profiles on the plans of pistol, and you decide which one you're using. I think, potentially, that's how it works. So I think, potentially, you can't benefit from um, the, the, the poison marker with the subsequent dice from the power sword in that fight action of course you've got a start ace so if you do a second fight action it, you're fine it's all, it's all good uh, you can you can then benefit from the poison marker you placed on with the first fight action so that's why i said um quite possibly you want to use the cp to put a poison marker on this or on if you can benefit from your poison marker from your first dice with all your subsequent dice then potentially it's not worth doing another reason that you really want people to be poisoned is grandfather's blessing so grandfather's blessing says whenever an enemy operative that has one of your poison tokens loses a wound within seven of this operative this operative regains one lost wound to a maximum of three lost wounds per turning point um, and only if the operative isn't incapacitated. This is kind of really good. Because, okay, yes, you're getting the 7 inch. 7 inch is quite a big range. So you're going to get, like, occasionally you'll get a passive... Um, a passive bonus um, wound back from somebody who's off doing something else. Because you don't need to be visible. Uh, you just need to be within 7. So something else happens over there. And you go, oh, you're just in 7 of my leader. My leader gains a wound. And, you're like, and the opponent's like, what? <laughs> um 
So, you know, oh, I, I've just been shot by this other guy and, and killed, and then to add insult to injury, you, your leader over here is going to gain a wound. Okay, great, right. That's going to make re that's really going to make your opponent frown. Um, but also, um, when you're in combat, you know, you strike your opponent, they strike you, you strike your opponent, you then gain a wound. And unlike the not being sure with whether the Plague Sword's toxic could benefit from the poison tokens, I am sure that you strike first with the... You know, if you charge, you strike with the Plague Sword, you poison them, they then strike you and do some wounds, you strike them, you can then definitely benefit from Grandfather's Blessing from the poison token that you've just placed with the Plague Sword. Yeah, because they're then losing a wound on that dice being resolved. So you can gain a wound back every time they they that you hit them after the first like that's really good in combination with the fact that you're ignoring wounds uh on a four up every time they throw a dice at you you're gaining wounds back right as you fight them it makes this model really challenging to put down especially in that combat environment right considering as well they're also probably going to be hitting you on one less so, and you've got up to four six damage on your sword, so you've got potentially decent de decent damage five dice as well, decent damage. So he's got great output, great resilience. He wants to be in combat. Um, what he doesn't necessarily want to be doing is actually firing his plasma pistol most of the time, but it's there. It was on the model. You've got it. Um, if you do do damage to yourself with with with, with supercharge, you can try and gain those wounds back as well, I guess. But the the main excitement for me with this guy is getting him into combat and then just being an absolute pain in the backside to try and remove. Plague caster, the sorcerer. So standard marine stat line with that minus one inch movement. Um, so he's got two psychic attacks. Bear in mind, he can do both of them because of the way the Astartes rule is worded. So you've got Entropy, which is a short range. So range 7 is not that short. Range 7, but it's not the longest range in the game. Um, saturate, Severe, and Poison. So you are poisoning people. You're always guaranteed a crit. And Saturate, ignore Cover, isn't it? So this is range 7. Four dice, hitting on threes, three seven, which is a weird swingy weapon profile. But you're guaranteed one crit. You're kind of hoping for two crits. Like, you're not by any means going to roll two sixes on four dice. Um, if you can get two crits through, I mean, happy days. It's not got piercing. Okay, so your opponent's still got a decent chance to save them. But if you can get two crits through Happy Days, because that's going to be 14 damage, and if your opponent, you know, a Space Marine could be unlucky um, and not be able to save that, unlikely, probably going to get at least two normal saves and save one crit. It's not, it's not that good. It's not that good. It has the potential to be really hilarious, but it's like, it's all right. Okay, because you're guaranteed a crit, but again, Against, it's got no piercing. So against most, like, marines, they roll three dice. They're going to get two normals to negate your crit. Some normal damage might go through, but it's like three dice. It's not going to do that much. It's going to get a poison on them. Um, against a, like, a five-up save model, it becomes a bit more compelling because they probably are only going to roll one save anyway. So your guaranteed crit gets through. And if they're a seven-wound guy, they just die, which is lovely. Um, but it's, it's a weird one. It's kind of... It's not weak. It's got seven crit. It would be ridiculous to call it weak. But it's not actually that reliable when you think about it. Then you've got Plague Wind, which is another really weird... Um, another really weird ranged weapon, right? So you're rolling six dice, which is loads. Hitting on threes, two, three. This has got infinite range. But it's also got torrent one inch. And it's got severe, so you're guaranteed a crit, but it, that's less relevant. It's got poison, it's got saturated, ignoring cover. Um, you know, you're going to do a decent old chunk of damage because you're rolling six dice. Um, it's not a bad gun. If they give you 
that cluster, especially if you get a double cluster. But if they give you the ability to resolve this on two models, it's pretty good. You know, you're going to kill things, like little things with this, probably reasonably easily. It's a pretty good gun. But it's not, it's not amazing. It's not amazing, okay? And then he's got a Corrupted Staff. Um, three, four, four dice hitting on threes. Severe Shock and Stun, which is not bad. Poison. Like, he doesn't really want to be in combat super hard. But if someone, he's not going to fall over like a chump. Like, with Shock and Stun, that's going to help him do what he really wants to do, which is, is stay alive, right? Um... Then he's got two abilities, Poisonous Miasma, which is also a bit kind of, eh, right? Uh, select one enemy operative visible to him within seven of the operative, or one enemy operative that's a valid target for this operative, so infinite range, right, if it's a valid target. That enemy gets a poison token. Um, if it doesn't already have one, if it already has one, inflict free damage on the operative instead. I'm just, I'm not... Okay, so if you've got a valid target... Why are you spending 1 AP to do that when you could spend 1 AP to do Plague Wind, right? Um, which has poison and therefore have a pretty good chance of getting 3 damage and a poison token rather than 3 damage or a poison token. Um, I guess where this is useful is if you have a spare CP. So if you for some reason have done Entropy, you've done Plague Wind or you know, you've, you've done things, you don't or you've done Plague Wind, you've done Putrescent with Vitality, which we'll read in a second. You don't want to move, um, and then you're like, well, I may as well throw out a Poison Token. That's cool. I guess it has a bit of utility with the one enemy operative visible to him within seven, so he has that thing where, you know, if your opponent's got the classic um, Sniper, on Conceal, you know, behind some heavy terrain, um, and you wobble up to within seven of them, you can at least then go, okay, cool, um... You got a poison token, which is not nothing. Um, but like, none of your you can't follow that up with anything. None of your other guns can, can, can go for somebody that, that is not a valid target. So that's it's, it's all right. Or you could just do three damage to somebody that's not like pushing on pushing through three damage onto a sniper. It's not that's not actually that bad. Um, so maybe that's the bit to focus on with him. But the reason, like, I actually think the plane cast is a bit. Yeah, and but the reason he's not my one to drop is this last ability because secretly he is your medic, and I think a space marine medic is a magical thing. Um, I know that like some other teams have the ability to that are space marines, like Angels of Death famously don't. Um, like I know that the legionaries can, uh, with with the with with the uh the librarian guy. And I think there's the Time Sorcerer as well uh, for the for the Thousand Suns um, and, and Phobos, but I don't really count them as Marines. But the point with all of these things is I don't think any of them are doing seven, that healing seven, right? So for one AP, select a friendly operative to visible within three. So it does have to be visible to within three. You roll 2d6. If you roll a seven, which is what your odds on to roll on 2d6 is the average roll, you heal seven, right? Um... Otherwise, you heal them amount of wounds equal to the highest D6. So, this has a chance, right? You could roll double one and heal two and feel very sad about your life. So, it is a gamble, but it's um, it's a gamble where the odds are very much in your favour. The most likely outcome from rolling two dice is that you hit that seven, okay? That's just how statistics work. Um... And being able to put seven wounds in back into something where your opponent has worked so hard to get rid of those wounds um, in, in, in the first place is really good. Also, also, let's read the whole ability again. Select one friendly operative visible to and within three of this operative. Roll 2d6. If the result is a 7, the selected operative regains 7 lost wounds. Otherwise, the selected operative regains wounds equal to the highest d6. An operative cannot perform this action while within control range of an enemy operative. There is nothing there about the target of the psychic action not being in control range of an enemy operative. 
right? So if you've got someone who's stuck in combat, a combat they don't want to be in, a combat that they are about to lose because your opponent's in that situation where they're like, "Cool, well I'm out now. I, I can when I fight you next, I can I can you know I get a crit, I'll finish you off." You don't move you. I mean, you can't run him, but you can sort of move five. And you could do a dash, and you could be like, "Right, I'm going to put wounds back into this guy." Who again, your opponents were phenomenally hard to pull those wounds down, like. They're just a really annoying team. I don't think, as you can see from everything else, they don't have this amazing damage output. But what they just have is they're just going to stand in the middle and stick in the middle. And if they get to pin you down into the kind of tar pity combats that they want, you're just going to st sit there and feel sad, right? Like, I'm amped for the team. I think they're really cool. But I think teams, like Eldar teams, are just going to be like, okay, lol, you stand in the middle, Plague Marines. We're just going to run around. We're going to pick you off from around the sides. We're going to come behind you. We're going to do this. I think they're in a really fun place. I need to play them. But I think they're in a really fun place where they're really, really strong at the things they're really, really strong at. But they have these really big weaknesses that can be exploited. Um, I think that's good. I do think they're going to be a little bit of a noob stomping team because I think kind of the default the default thing for people who aren't like and I, I put myself in this category because it's certainly my default especially when I'm playing elites is kind of let's all go into the middle and have a mosh pit <laughs> right um Plague Marines thrive, I think, in that environment. They basically, they're the team where you, what you want to do is go, okay, well, we've gone into the middle and we're having a mosh pit, and then we're just unaccountably still alive, and you're all, you're, you're all counting as injured, and we're all saving extra wounds here, there, everywhere, and the plague caster's healing, and the leader's healing, and all this stuff's kicking off. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I rate him really highly for that heal ability. His other abilities don't really set my world on fire, and which is why I might occasionally be like, oh, do you take him? But I think having a medic on a team... I don't normally rate medics this highly, but having a medic on a team that it, it, it just it plays into the ridiculous gimmick that the rest of the team has of just going, I, I don't really want to die. I just want to be here. That's fine. That's me. The Bombardier, or as I said for the entire of the previous video when I talked about these, the Bombardier, which I thought was funny, but and people were just like, are you stupid? Don't know how to say Bombardier. And I was like, Bombardier, yeah, it's a quite a nice beer. Um, anyway, um, it's a Grandier. He's a little bit, like I've been going about how, love, how much I love Grandiers. I love this guy a little bit less. Uh, like, Grandiers are always a bit lackluster on teams that are all hitting all threes anyway, because it's like, oh, now my grenades hit on three. Um... Okay, cool. Like, weirdly, his bolter is exciting. Because there are only two... Spoilers. There are only two long-range weapons in this team, and they're two bolters, right? So he has a bolter. Now, while we talk about the bolter, I'm going to break my usual order of things and talk about a piece of equipment, which is an auto-take for this team. You have playgrounds, which I've, I've screenshotted and put down the bottom here. So playgrounds, virulent toxins ooze from these projectiles, so those struck by them are infected with deadly diseases. So your bolt guns and bolt pistols have poison and severe. So just bear that in mind, you can put poison on with the bolt gun, and you're going to be guaranteed a crit with your bolt gun, which it makes it a little bit tastier. Okay, so let's read his rules. Grenadier. This operative can use blight and crack grenades. Okay. Uh, I've put the profiles down the bottom there for blight and crack grenades. Okay. Doing so doesn't count towards any limited uses that you have. Blah, 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 blah. Whenever it's doing so, improve the hit stat of that weapon by one. And blight grenades have the toxic weapon rule. See, right. We, we know what toxic is. Toxic is plus one, plus one damage when you're fighting against someone that's poisoned, it's the same rule that the Plague Champion's sword has, right? Plus one, plus one damage against somebody that's poisoned. Now, first thing I want to say, and I'm not trying to slap anybody, I've seen some other content creators do rundowns of this team and come away with the... And I, I've done my fair share of failing to read, and Zimbad always DMs me and go, you read this bit wrong, you read that bit wrong, or occasionally it's really helpful to leave comments for everybody else to see as well. But I have seen other people make this mistake. You don't get to gain toxic on your crack grenades. You don't get to make a 5-6 crack grenade. As, as, as amazing as that would be, um, you don't get to make a 5-6 crack grenade. So what we're looking at 
is he has the following weapon profile, really. Assuming that you're shooting at somebody who is poisoned, okay, you've got a bolter that has four dice sitting on threes, uh, three, four, uh, infinite range, and can poison people and is guaranteed a crit. Or you've got a blank grenade, which is going to be f uh, four dice sitting on threes, exactly the same. It's going to be three, five against a poison target. It's only going to be two, four against a non-poison target. Bear that in mind. Um, three, five is pretty good. Okay. Um, range six, a blast two. Um, it is it is severe, so it's guaranteed a crit in the same way. It has saturate. Okay, so it ignores cover, and it can itself put poison on. And then you also have crack grenades, which are going to be a crack grenade but hitting on threes, right? So four dice hitting on threes, four, five, but piercing one and saturate. Um, so, if you're not within six, you're shooting your bolter twice. If you've closed to within six, it's very simple. You're basically going, if I throw a blight, am I going to get to hit more than one miniature? If you are going to get to hit more than one miniature especially if they're poisoned, it's worth throwing a blank grenade. Otherwise, throw a crack grenade, right? Because I'd rather have 4-5 piercing one, even against a poison target, I'd rather have 4-5 piercing one than 3-4. Three, 3-5, four. Three, sorry, not piercing one, right? Because 4-5 is still better than 3-5, right? So don't get carried away and go, oh, the black grenade is a special thing. I think even with the toxic black grenade... Uh, you need to be making sure that you're getting that blast for it to be worth it. But as soon as you have that blast, it flips and you go, okay, I'll take the black grenade, okay? Um, and then don't forget that you throw your grenade and then you also follow up by shooting your bolter because you're an Astarte. You don't want to be in combat with this guy because he only has sad little fists, okay? Um, so, so bear that in mind as well. But I think he's pretty good. Um, he has one of your only two possible long-range guns, um, and he has crack grenades if he gets close enough, which is one of your few piercing weapons. Where you only have the, the crack grenade and the plasma pistol. Okay. So when you're playing into current bogeyman uh, Thousand Sons, you're actually not that sad because they've not nerfed that many of your guns, but that's another story. Fighter. So the fighter is is interesting. It's um, in the vein of a lot of marine fighters. Okay, so he's got a five dice, three up save, uh, three up, three up, three up to hit. Sorry, four five damage, brutal, severe shock and poison. So he hands out poison. That's fine. Uh, shock. So you first time you strike with a hit, you, you also discard a hit. Right. Uh, severe. So you're guaranteed a crit, and brutal. So. Um, your normals can only be parried with, with crits, which is pretty good. It's like a pretty good, a pretty solid marine melee weapon that's going to do damage. And then you have this interesting flail ability. So flail is, it's essentially, it's an alternative to doing one of your fight actions. I'm going to do the weird thing of reading the red bullet first. Because I've seen people not read the red bullets. The operative cannot perform this action while it has a conceal order or during an activation in which it performed more than one fight action. And it cannot perform more than one fight action during an activation in which it performs this action. So this takes up one of your fight slots. Okay? So what you are doing with this model is that you're going to charge in and then you're almost certainly going to hit the person that you're in combat with with your flail of corruption. Okay? And then you're going to reassess. And you're going to go, okay. My flail, I can choose for one AP to flail. I do D3 plus 2 damage on each other operative visible to and within 2 of the operative. Okay. And if you roll a 3, they become poisoned if they don't already have a poison token. Now, sometimes this will be worth doing even against... Um, a single model because sometimes you will charge in and you will fight and then you go oh my opponent is on three wounds or less so i could do a fight action right where i'd have to roll a dice but i could potentially roll all misses so i'm just going to do this instead and i'm going to do three damage and not have to worry about it like it's edge case because you're probably going to get at least a hit with the flail of corruption but it's worth knowing that it's there right okay. otherwise you're going to use it when you um if you genuinely go into a pile of guys and that, and, there's, and you've got the multiple guys in two of you to try and clear hordes a little bit, but you can't flail twice, 
right and you can't fight twice and flail and just fix that in your mind generally speaking most of the time you're probably not using the flail action just because it takes up one of your fights and your flail that you have your actual flail of corruption attack is really powerful right oh i've lost my how professional there we go heavy gunner so the heavy gunner is interesting um he has a really good flamer so five dice hitting on twos three three a seven inch range which is nice um saturate severe torrent two inches and poison so you've got three three you're ignoring cover you're always guaranteed at least a crit you've got torrent two inch you're putting on the poison you're rolling five dice hitting on twos it is good it's better than a regular flamer um the biggest problem with this guy is that you're not really gonna he do, he doesn't he doesn't mix with the Astartes rule. This is my big problem with him. You've got a Plague Spewer, but that's not a Bolter. So you can only shoot that once. And then you could do two fight actions, but you've got Fists. You don't want to be in combat. You know, what do you do with this character? You move, dash, and use the Plague Spewer. That's that's basically the, 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 the one thing that he can do. He can move, he can dash, he can use the Plague Spewer. He kind of doesn't want to be in combat with his Fists. Um, it's kind of a bit sad. Like, I think this is the warrior that you drop. The warrior that you drop, as averse to the warrior who's a specialist that you keep, right? But I think this is the operative, I should have said, that you drop, like, most of the time. I think he is the weakest member of the team, even though that playing spew is pretty good. I think if you're playing on Into the Dark, uh, especially against a, a low wound count team, or even if you're playing against Volkus against a low wound count team, remember that you get a lethal five up against models that are on the ground floor of a stronghold in Volkus as well, and you've got these two giant strongholds on the Volkus map, then perhaps you take the Plague Marine Heavy Gunner, and you probably do drop the Warrior to take the Plague Marine Heavy Gunner, uh, because I think the Warrior is... <sighs> you know, it's funny. Against elite teams, the Warrior is actually a better miniature, I think, than the Bombardier. Right, I know we haven't seen the Warrior yet, but against elite teams, you want both the Warrior and the Bombardier because you drop this guy. And against Horde teams, um, you know, the Bombardier, because he has that blast grenade, probably edges it out over the over the Warrior in, in my in my view. So yeah, you, you I think most of the time this guy's staying on the bench looking beautiful, but very occasionally you're gonna sub him in in, in exchange for the Warrior. Um because you're against that horde team in that environment where they're, you're going to get lethal five up some of the time. Let me know in the comments if you think I'm dead wrong. Then we've got the Icon Bearer. So the Icon Bearer has a Bolt Pistol. Remember that the Bolt Pistol is going to have Playgrounds. And he's also got a Plague Knife, so he quite likes being in combat because he's rolling five dice. Hitting on three is three, four, severe, guaranteed to crit, and he's putting poison on. It's pretty good rolling five dice, Okay being guaranteed a crit. These are all good things, and bear in mind all the other things I've already said about how I believe that Plague Marines generally want to be in combat. Right? You've got the standard Icon Bearer rule of counting your APL as one higher when you're determining control of a marker, which is nice. And then whenever you're alive, you're getting the Contagion strategy ploy for free. Um, so you're pretty much going to always get it for free in turning point one, and you're... Well, you're always getting it free in turning point one. You're pretty much always going to get it for free in turning point two as well. Um, because... He's unlikely to be dead at the start of turning point two, right? Um, I wouldn't be precious with him. I'd move him up the board. I'd get him into the thick of it. Use that plus APL to, um, you know, keep keep control of the middle objective. Use that plague knife. Get him into combat. If he dies, okay, fine. You're, you're one CP a turn down, effectively. But you're only a six-model team. You can't really afford... To, now, I know in some games... Some of the time, you have to hang a model back on your home objective because you have to keep pressing the home objective and that's going to be important and tempting for you. That's true, okay? But I I don't think it's the, actually the Icon Bearer you do that. I think if you end up doing that, maybe it's the Warrior that we're going to lock in a minute or, or possibly even actually the uh, the Bombardier that you, you, you leave near the back because they've got bolters. Um, Icon Bearers are in this weird space, in that if he didn't, a lot of people have said that Icon of Contagion, the, the zero CP thing is broken and why it's there, right? 
I basically think Space Marine Icon Bearers go one of two ways. You've got... The, this is very similar to the Legionaries Icon Bearer. Right, the Legionary Icon Bearer does the Icon Bearer thing, um, and then it gives you a free CP every turn. So it's an auto-take. It's really good. The Thousand Suns Icon Bearer just does the Icon Bearer thing, and therefore you drop him and take a Warrior, and nobody ever takes the Icon Bearer. Like, Icon Bearers seem to be in this place where people don't really value the plus one APL much as a concept they have that but then they either have another rule that makes them amazing and an auto include right usually to do with your cp economy or they don't have another rule and then you don't bother with them um which i think is an interesting thing for space marine icon bearers right warrior the last i mean talking him up because his, his, his name warrior just me you're gonna think he's gonna be rubbish so he has two special rules over three he has three things that make him special compared to where he could be right he has a plague knife he could just have fists no no he has a plague knife um but notice vexingly like his plague knife is called a plague knife but the, the icon bearer's plague knife has five attack his plague knife has four attack that's weird considering that they have the same name right and his bolt gun has toxic and the um the the bombardier's bolt gun doesn't have toxic so just be aware of those things he's a weird guy okay but yeah he has a plague knife it's not as good as the the other plague knife it's not five dice but it's still nice to have it's still a guaranteed crit in combat he's got a bolt gun with toxic so he really wants to be at range okay um because he can add that extra add that extra damage which is amazing um he has repulsive fortitude. That's like his special warrior rule. So whenever an operative is shooting this operative, your defense dice of five up is critical. Are critical successes. I think he's really good. Like he's he's even more. Um, he's even like he is the guy that you task to hang back a little bit because he has this repulsive fortitude, which unlike all of your other stuff, is actually just a ranged benefit, right? Um, because we don't care about our defense dice in combat and he has a long range gun and his long range gun if you've got a poison marker his long range gun can do four five which is pretty good uh, and then if, if somebody comes for him um he's still you know you're still gonna have contagion up he's still gonna put you onto wounded he's still got a decent little knife with severe okay um and he, he's still gonna sit there and go well you know i i'm on this objective now so if you're one marine we're gonna tie for a while like yeah he's really good he's, he's like i i see him like an anchor okay um i think you take him most of the time in preference to the heavy gunner but let me know um what you think in the comments on that one we look at the equipment so their equipment is also quite good. It's 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 quite straightforward, and my my smooth brain that's not very good at kill team quite likes it. So plague bells. When the plague bell tolls, death guard are infused with corrupted energy, heightening their unholy resistance to extraordinary levels. You can ignore any changes to the stats of friendly plague marine operatives from being injured, including their weapon stats. Yeah, I mean, you never leave home without it. It is an American Express equipment, as they say. You, I, I cannot fathom not bringing this. There doesn't appear to be a core rule that your movement can't be reduced below a certain number anymore. So you don't really want to be injured as a 5-inch move Plague Marine. It's not a thing that you want in your life. So we're just going to ignore the whole injured mechanic. It's not part of the game. Bye-bye, mechanic. We're just going to be fine, right? Playgrounds. Again, yes, another American Express equipment. You just don't leave home without it. Okay. Virulent toxins ooze from these projectiles, so those struck by them are infected with deadly diseases. So your bolt guns and bot pistols gain poison and severe, which is, is really good. And we've been talking about that as we go along, so I'm not going to go through it again. So the two that I need to talk about a little bit more. Poison vents. Activating vents in their power armor, Plague Marines may unleash clouds of sickening fumes that clog the lungs of nearby foes. Whenever an enemy operative that has one of your poison tokens is activated within three of a friendly Plague Marine, inflict D3 damage instead of a normal one. So, okay, this is really good, but it's also a little bit not really good. In that it is situational. Um, you have to be within three rather than anywhere, and then a third of the time... 
it effectively does nothing. Because you roll your d3 and you roll a 1 and it was going to do 1 damage anyway. Like that's the core rule of being poisoned. So that's it. Don't get me wrong though. It's still good. It's still potential free extra damage that all you've had to do is spend an equipment point. So like taking poison vents isn't a bad thing. But if you have to drop poison vents because you really want to... Uh, universal equipments. I think it's the it's the second thing that you drop. Um, you know, and I can see dropping it. Not never, right? Yeah, blind grenades. Oh, I just eh. uh, these devices are packed with explosive shards of jagged metal, deadly pathogens that poison any unfortunate enough to survive the initial blast. But unlike the bombardier. Um, Black grenade, it doesn't have toxic, so it's only ever going to do two four. It's only ever going to do blast two, um, and it's hitting off fours. Now, I don't rate it much. Like, pause for thought because you do have your fighter. Your fighter doesn't have a ranged weapon, and I did say when I did the Night Lords review, and I do think from playing Night Lords, I like to take crack grenades because I like to have my lightning claw guy have the option to do a ranged attack because there are times where you move and you dash and you could you can't get into combat with somebody but you could touch them with a grenade and that gives him something to do with his third apl sometimes are uh, um you know if you have a pure combat guy with no gun you end up struggling to use your third apl some of the time so if you think that though would you not rather take a crack grenade um which has a higher damage stat and piercing like i know people are gonna well this has poison we have so many ways of giving out poison don't worry about it right um this has blast too like yeah it does and again maybe if you're playing on into the dark where you're gonna lethal five up or you and you're, and you're playing against horde team then you're gonna want this over the crack range you can be flexible but it's not an auto pick it's it's just it's 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 a frag that has like poison and and severe, which is fine. But I don't rate frag grenades, so it's yeah, it's eh, it's one that I'm probably not taking a lot of the time. What universal equipment do I like? I mean ladders. You have a five inch move, so you're not getting on top of stuff very easily without ladders, right? Uh, now, there's a question that says, does this team that doesn't really have that much in the way of long-range shooting, does it really want to be on the vantage points in its own half? You can't use the ladders to help you go up and charge your opponent's vantage models, right? So do you really care all that much about being on your home vantage points um, to shoot with your bolter? Maybe, maybe... Like, I think you could survive on Volkus without ladders. I think you obviously desperately need ladders on Beta Decima because you need to get up there because the, the the objectives are often up on the things, right? You need to be on the things to get the things. Um, crack grenades, as I've already spoken about. A weird little shout-out to the portable barricade because it just occurs to me like, oh, well... What if I make one of my really quite difficult to kill marines have a two-up save? Um, you know, especially as I'm going to have that, like, one guy um, at the, you know, potentially have a warrior, depending on what the primary is, I'm potentially going to have a warrior kind of at the back holding the fort, right? Um, trying to hold down that home objective by himself. And it's like, well, I mean, I'm going to stand here, I'm going to have my two-up save, I'm going to be crit, crit saving on a five, I'm going to have my, my damage reduction from being Nurgle. Um, uh, I think it's probably a meme, but it's 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 quite funny uh, to think about. And when you think as well, they've got this thing where, oh, well, you know, with a, with a portal barricade, you only move three. And it's like, conveniently, <laughs> there's a ploy in my army list that gives me ceaseless in exchange for only moving three. So maybe that's what I want to do with my Bolter Man, who can have ceaseless now with his portal barricade. I think it's a meme. I think it's dumb. I think it's probably not actually tactically the right choice. But I think it's kind of funny and worth thinking about because sometimes the answer to, um, like, oh, well, I'm really good at this one thing. Should I take some equipment to give me, like, an extra grenade to do a little bit of more offense because that's where I need support? Or should I double down on the thing I'm really good at and just be really annoying? Um, and that brings a certain amount of joy all of its own. Right. Bonus slide. 
because I was struggling to get my head around the poison. So I've done a, a nice... Hopefully this helps. Let me know if this, in the comments if this helped you. Okay. So on the left, we got all the sources of poison. So you've got two ploys. The virulent poison ploy, which is spend a CP to give out a poison. And you've got the poisonous demise, which is on death. You can explode for a CP. And then you can give out poison to everybody within... Was it three? Um... You've also got every weapon on the team. Assuming you're taking the playgrounds, every weapon on the team, apart from the plasma pistol on the boss, fists on the couple of guys that are stuck fighting with fists, and the crack grenade on the bombardier, every other weapon in the team can give out poison, right? Which is why I think you might not want to need to need to use the um the 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 poison ploys all that often like you still might but every single weapon bearing in mind you shoot your bolts twice every single weapon can stick can stick poison on somebody which is nice um and then you've also got the poisonous miasma plague caster spell which i think is a bit niche as well so there's your sources of poison what's your poison doing for you okay one damage on activation if a model is poisoned understood that's base Increased range to seven inches on the con no to three inches on the contagion ploy. Increased range to seven inches on the nurglings. Increased range to seven inches on the curse of rot. It enables the healing on the champion, so it lets the champion heal when he when when people with poison are wound uh, take wounds. Right. It increases the damage of the champion sword. It increases the damage on the blight grenade that the bombardier owns. Okay, and it increases the damage on the warrior's bolt gun. Those are the three things that have toxic. Okay, and then finally, if you've gone for your poison vents, it's D3 damage on activation if within three of the poison vents. So I just, I found it really helpful for me to lay out, okay, exactly what is this poison, what actually is giving it, and what actually is benefiting from it, right? And so you can kind of see... The main person that cares about poison is the champion, right? The other stuff's there, and it's good, and you want to get as much poison as you can, but it really is the champion that has two things, two strong abilities, that really benefit from your opponent being poisoned. And that's why, as I've said, where you might want to use virulent poison just to make sure that you, you know, if you have to spend a CP to let your champion do his big stuff, then you have to spend the CP to let your champion do his big stuff. Tech Ops, I'm really drawn towards Secure Center, right? So at the end of the turning, each turning point after the first, if the total APL of friendly operatives within three of the center of the kill zone is greater than that of enemy operatives, you score one VP. Uh, if the total APL of friendly operatives on the center line, but more than three inches from the center of the kill zone is greater than that of enemy operatives, you score one VP. I think that's where you want to play with Plague Marines. I'm a little bit worried... Um, that if you run into another marine team who also try and take secure center, like Night Lords and Legionary, um, I'm thinking especially Corn Legionary, are very killy in combat. Plague Marines are very resilient in combat. Who wins that fight? If it comes down to a mosh pit between Night Lords and Plague Marines, or Corn Legionaries and Plague Marines, who actually wins? I'm not sure. I can't quite see it in my head. But the thing is, you almost kind of stuck because you can't, I don't think, do a lot of these very well. You can do take ground. Depending on the map layout, you might prefer take ground to secure center. So to remind, take ground, um, in kill zone Volkers, if friendly operatives control any stronghold terrain features within your opponent's territory. Remember, it doesn't say wholly within. Important, kids. Uh, within your opponent's territory, you score 2 VP. That might be something you would try and do instead, right? Depending on if, if if there's an objective in a stronghold and you get your guys into it uh, and it's a bit easier for you than going into the dead center, you might go for this one instead. Like, I think it could be a little bit easier than secure center, um, depending on where the objectives are and stuff. Uh and then it also says that in any other kill zone... No, sorry, hang on. You Also on Volcus, you can score singles for uh, the, the heavy uh, ruins, the large and small ruins as well. Um, but they have to be the enemy territory. The reason that the um, 
the stronghold one is nice is that on some of the maps the stronghold is mostly in your territory or mostly in one of the territories and a little bit in the enemy's territory and it doesn't say wholly within the enemy's territory so it's like quite close to you right so you can get it quite easily uh, in kills and gallow dark it's for each access point on the center line or within your opponent's territory you score one vp again you look at the map you go well do i want to go on, on on into the dark do i want to go secure center or do i want to go um take ground um and it's going to depend on where those doors are on that map relative to how easily you think you can get to them um and then in any other kill zone so beta decima or whatever else you're doing for each terrain feature with heavy terrain within your opponent's territory you control you score one vp Meh. right um yeah so what do you do on better decima <laughs> it's none of it it's none of it you just die um no i guess you do secure center as well maybe i don't think you can do contain i don't I think you're not fast enough for contain, and you're going to say, what, Phil? Contain is about turtling in your area. Like, yes. The problem I have with contain, if you're up trying to, if you're up trying to, like, say you've got the, the map here, and you've got one guy, like, down here on your home objective, and the rest of the guys are on the middle objective, and then the enemy goes, cool, I've worked out that you've taken contain, I'm just going to send one guy just to go down this flank and stand within, um within six of your drop zone. Like, you can't turn the ship fast enough to go and deal with that. And you've only got, especially on a wide map, you've only got six bodies, so you can't screen the whole thing, and you don't want to start trying to take barricade. You know, you're not a human team that's got the numbers and takes all the barricades and does all the stuff. So I think that they're just going to get round you. Think about Blood Bowl, right? They're just like, they're basically they're going to get round your linemen. Um, and, and make for your end zone and you just can't do anything about that right so i don't think you go for contain and i struggle actually to see how you take in the um the, the secret like okay champion maybe if you're gonna get your big flail guy into combat right maybe against weenies if you think you can kill them with one bolter shot but you're not bolt rifles you're bolters like, I just can't see champion. You haven't got that many killers. You're not a damage output team. So, it's not easy for me to say, oh yeah, no, take champion. Uh, when it comes to overrun, uh, again, you have to be a bit faster and a bit more maneuverable for overrun. You have to incapacitate enemy operatives while you're wholly within your opponent's table half. You might be able to get just in their table half, and then you sort of want to sit in in their table half, having like maybe it's a thing. Maybe 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 you can do overrun because you can literally be just just over just an inch into their table half and killing their dudes. But I think that's harder than secure center. Is my feeling. Because you're essentially doing the same thing, but you have to be an inch further forwards. Because for secure centre, you need to be on the centre line, and you need to have killed some of their dudes, because otherwise they're just also going to be on the centre line. Right? Um, yeah. So I don't really raise over them. And storm objectives, again, I think you need to be quick to do. Um, you know, at the end of each friendly operative activation, if it controls an objective marker, the enemy operative is controlled at the start of that activation that's wholly within your opponent's territory. Um, or that's wholly within your opponent's territory. You're not going to get over there to their home objective marker as quickly as you might want. Right? Because you've got an inch less movement than you'd, you'd, you'd hope for. And I just... I don't know. I don't think... I don't think it's going to their strong points. So I think... Again, let me know in the comments if you think that I'm dead wrong. I think you're basically doing a toss-up most games between secure ground and secure centre, depending on what you think is more doable on the map that you're on. When it comes to buying the team, it's a really interesting one. I think by far the most sensible way to buy this team is to buy the starter set for £67.50. Um, it is currently out of stock, and as far as I can tell, unless you find a smaller store, it's not 
there is going to be another print run. It is an evergreen product, but the new print run is not expected until January. You're going to tell me that you could buy a box of Plague Marines, um, and you could convert this team out of Plague Marines, but the box of Plague Marines is like 37 quid for seven Plague Marines. And so, and they don't look as cool as the Plague Marine heroes, and you might have a sorcerer. And you'll need to then buy a sorcerer from somewhere. You can find the sorcerer on eBay for 10, 12 quid. Or you can try and find the other, the, the worst sorcerer model that was in um, the the 8th edition starter set. But, like, I'm pretty sure buying this, you've got a second team of really cool models. You Potentially, if you don't want them, you could probably sell Justian. Um, I just think buying the starter set is the way to go. But if you're really inspired by the team and you don't already have them, you didn't pick up the starter set, then, um, yeah, it's not going to be back in stock until January. But, but, like, there's actually a lot of people who were sitting on Death Guard hero boxes who are now having to sell them on eBay at, like, cut down prices as well. So, bear all of this stuff in mind. But, yeah, buy the starter set if you want this team and you didn't already get it uh, with Death Guard heroes. Final thoughts. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, I really like this team. I'm enthusiastic about them, which is why I've been able to talk for nearly an hour and a half, which is longer for a simpler, an objectively simpler team, because I've been thinking about them pretty well constantly since they came out. I, I think they're in a really interesting place where they're powerful, you know, top of A tier, near the top of A tier, but I don't think they're overpowered. I don't think they're particularly overpowered. I actually, for those of you that tuned into the live stream last night, you've already heard my thoughts on this. I don't genuinely think Marines are overpowered. People are saying all Marines are overpowered. I don't actually think that's true. I did, now I don't. I think that Warp Coven and Legionaries are overpowered because I think the ignore piercing on a 2-up or 3-up armor save is pretty broken. But I don't think that Angels of Death Knight and Night Lords are actually that overpowered. And I think these sit comparably with those other teams, so I, I like them. This is probably going to be the next team I do. Because I'm committed to various hobby challenges and bingo cards and other things, I'm probably not going to get around to painting them um, until the new year. Zimbad's whispering in my ear, like the serpent in the garden, going, oh, but you, you could just do Plague Marines now. You could just sack off the Triumph of St. Catherine and sack off the idea that you were also going to paint fi finally paint Fulgrim this year. Just sack off those things and just do Plague Marines right now. Wouldn't that be much cooler? And I'd be like, yeah. The problem with that, Zim, is that I told people I was going to take the Brood Brothers to um, a tournament as well. And if I've got painted Plague Marines, I'm going to want to take them. But like, He's all, yeah, but you shouldn't have done that either. You shouldn't do anything. You should just do the thing that gives you the most joy and go and do Plague Marines. But I, I'm going to try and be good. Right? So it's, a, it's that Catholic upbringing. I'm going to try and do the thing that I, I want to do slightly less. I, I'm going to do these as my next team. Probably in January, probably in the new year. Like, I own the models now. I might crack and play some games with them. I really need to practice with the Brute Brothers before the tournament, though, so probably not. But yeah, that's the, that's, that's, the, that's the current thing fizzing in the back of my brain. But I am excited about these. Um... Thank you to all of my uh, members, subscribers, supporters, especially those of you who are active in the Discord and those of you that pop into the live streams that we do every Wednesday. If you ever sat here and wondered why is there no Tales of Impulse video on a Wednesday, it's because they do a live stream on a Wednesday. And then the, 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 the VOD from the live stream is members only. So you have to... That's the one little bit that I paywall. That's the big thing that people that pay get is they get to watch all the live streams back. Uh, and that's probably like a hundred hours of content now or something i don't know um but like yeah that's my sales pitch if you want to watch hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of me rambling while paint dries on my brush and i forget to paint uh you could become a channel member as well and speaking of channel members i gotta give a shout out to a uh, compendium lover who is subscribed at the very very top tier the topmost tier and gets his very own shout out in every single video all right, guys, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Looking forward to reading all your comments. Um, cheery, 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 cheery. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. bye, bye, bye.